Good morning, everyone. Remember to take the announcements with you and take a look at those so you know what's going on and when it's happening this week. Um, and I'm going to start with um, a verse from Philippians 2.8. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus came to earth as a baby and as a servant to others. Let's let God's love and power move through us and let us listen for the voice of God so we know um, how to be obedient and who to serve in our lives um, and then to just follow Jesus' example in being that humble servant and obedient to God. So let's join together today and greet let's one another fellowship and then yeah. we'll uh, take hands here and we'll sing thank you michael <laughs> let's do that <laughs> Let's eat meat on the land that takes plants and flowers with streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your day. Blessed be your day when I found in the desert place. So I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your day. Still, I would say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your day when the sun is shining down on me. When the world is all as it should be, blessed be your day. Blessed be your day on the road, not to suffer me. Those days in the offer me, blessed be your day. Give and take away. Give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your day. Give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed Let us pray. Today, O oh God, help us to make right choices and to stand by those right choices we have already made. We need your guidance and your empowerment. Amen.
You may be seated. Been, I've been waiting on you. Okay, you can sit right here. You can just come and sit right here. You want to sit right here? No, right down here. Right down here, you can see me, okay? Right down here, you can see me. Oh, you see my mom? I didn't know you knew my mom. Oh, right there? Okay. <laughs> Dad, I'm sitting right there. <laughs> So, I know, but eyes on me, okay? I'm going to tell you a story. How's that? Is that a deal? Okay, put on your listening ears. All right. This is going to be good. <laughs> so, if I was to ask this morning, what makes you happy? What might you tell me? What would you tell me might make you happy? Does playing with mom and dad make you happy? Oh, good. All right. We'll take that as a yes. Well, you know what, if I ask some boys and girls what made them happy, they might say, yeah, they might say winning a soccer game makes them happy. Yes. Oh, okay. Or they might say having lots of friends makes them happy. Yeah. And we all want to be happy. But does it, it might not surprise you, though, to know that God wants you to be happy, too. Well, God wants us to be happy, but Jesus says, Happiness is sort of different than what you and I might think. <laughs> Most of us think that being happy might mean having lots of something, like maybe having lots of toys makes you happy, or come on up, Jackson, or having lots of friends might make you happy. But this is what Jesus said makes us happy. So I want you to listen carefully because this is right out of Jesus, out of the Bible, out of God's word, okay? One day Jesus went up on a mountain and he took his disciples with him and he had them sit on the ground around him. So pretend you're the disciples and sit really quietly. Oh, no, nope, the disciples were good listeners. Okay, so let's be a good listener. So they sat very quietly. And this is some of the things that Jesus said to them that would make them happy. Okay, are you ready? And I wrote them down so I wouldn't forget them because there's a lot of them. Okay, Jesus said, be happy when you're poor in spirit, because then you'll find your riches are in the kingdom of heaven. He said, be happy even when you lose something that's most dear to you, because then you'll feel the love of God the Father, who is, should be the most dear to you. He said, be happy with what you have, because you'll find that your heavenly Father gives you everything you need. He said, be happy when you're hungry for the things of God, like when you're hungry to come to Sunday school and church, because then you'll find that only God can satisfy you. Be happy when you care for others, because it is in caring for others that you will find that you have a heavenly father who cares for you. And be happy when your heart is right with God, because then it will, you will see God's work in you and in the world around you. And he said, too, be happy when you help others, 
to get along peaceably with one another because it is then you'll know the peace that comes from being a part of the family of God. And be happy when others treat you badly because you follow me, because you know I'm with you and your reward will be great. So you see, Jesus didn't teach us that happiness is having a lot of something, like a lot of toys or a lot of money or things like that. He taught us it was about an attitude of what's in our hearts. And so I brought this B this morning because those things we just read from the Bible is called the Beatitudes. And I want you guys to think this week about how you can live those things in your life. And so when you do that, think about a B and then remember to be like Jesus. Be like Jesus. That's right because then we'll be happy when we're acting like Jesus did, okay? And we'll help others to see Jesus too. So let's have a prayer this morning, okay? Can you pray with me, Jackson? Dear God, help us to have the happiness you want for us. Happiness that comes not from what happens to us, but from what happens inside of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, you can go back and sit with your dad. Back there, we're done. <laughs>
His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. In the first frame of the comic strip, we see a harried middle-aged gentleman lying on a couch with a psychologist sitting in a chair next to him. The counselor is listening intently and typing notes on his laptop computer, and the caption reads, I have a problem, doctor. I drive a Mercedes-Benz. I have a beach house in Bermuda, 12-room penthouse in the city, mansion in Malibu, and a 90-foot yacht. My clothes are made by the finest tailors in London. I have a world-class, fully stocked wine cellar, but I'm still not happy. In the second frame, we find the psychologist pondering this for a moment and then asking the man, do you have a Rolex? And then in the third frame, we see the ecstatic man leaping with joy, frantically waving his hands in the air, running out of the room, exclaiming with a smile, no, doc, I don't. Thank you. Thank you. And that would be funny, wouldn't it? If it wasn't so true. I mean, we live in a world of things, don't we? And far too often, we look for happiness in that one next thing, a vacation maybe, or some trinket, that next life experience. Joy is so often elusive, though, maybe even out of our hands, or at least it feels that way sometimes. We long for happiness, but can't seem to find it. And I wonder if it's because we're looking in all the wrong places. What do you think? Not long ago, there was a conference for mental health professionals. It had the auspicious title of The Habits of Happy People. It was sponsored by the prestigious Institute for Brain Potential, a real cutting-edge group, and their premise, at least according to the literature, was only 10% of all the unhappiness people experience comes from life circumstances. Only 10%. Upwards of 50%, they claimed, is most likely genetic, and I would add or learn behavior from genetic sources. The balance, roughly 40% of all the, quote, unhappiness in our world and in our lives is within our power to change. They found that viewing problems as normal and predictable versus denying or even ignoring them is a primary key, and reframing issues in a positive way, being optimistic versus pessimistic or not ruminating on a problem or <clears throat> trying to escape from it will cause you to, quote, sleep better, lower your blood pressure, balance glucose levels, and slow the amyloidal plaque buildup in your brain, which is a major contributing factor to cognitive impairment. Now think about that. Because the implications are kind of huge. If we simply change our perspective from selfish to selfless, from me to we, if we become grateful, as in count your blessings, if we just do that, our happiness will be exponentially enhanced. Which, when you cut through all the academic chatter, sounds a lot like blessed are the pure in heart, right? And blessed are the meek. MRI studies show that our orbital prefrontal cortex, this 
part of your brain physiologically changes when we accept the fact that we're not perfect. And even more so when we embrace imperfection as a gift. According to the scans, our brains dramatically change when we have, quote, values and meaning and life goals that are based on something bigger than ourselves. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Happy are those who long to be connected with God. It's all cutting edge stuff. Cutting edge neurological stuff. 2,000 year old cutting edge neurological stuff. I mean, think about it from where you stand. Make it personal and be honest, at least with yourself. Who is the most unhappy character you know? No names, please. Just picture them for a moment. And then ask yourself what values, what personality traits, what priorities they possess. Then ask yourself if that's someone you want as a role model. Just before Christmas, in Gary Watterson's Sunday school class, we did a study on Dr. Seuss's The Grinch, that green, hairy, cantankerous creature who looks down on Whoville for a mount, from a mountaintop of garbage, I'm sure you remember. Everything he sees disgusts him, particularly the happy who's. To him, they're overly enamored with the trappings of Christmas, the presents and partying and decorations and such. The Grinch has issues from way back, and I get that. Most of us have issues. We don't know what the Grinches are. In fact, we don't even know what most people's are. We may not even be aware of our own. Maybe he was young, and he was teased. Maybe for his looks or mocked for a Christmas gift that he'd made at school. And all that festered over the years. We simply don't know. What we do know is that now the Grinch loathes everything. Again, I'm sure you've heard the story. So the Grinch decides to destroy Christmas. He steals all the presents and decorations and lights. He ruins everything for the Who's, or so he thinks. Only then he hears them singing on Christmas morning anyway. Every Who down in Whoville, the tall and the small, without any presents at all. It doesn't make sense to him. He simply cannot understand the joy. How can those who mourn be comforted? How can those who are poor in spirit relish in the kingdom without ribbons or tags, without boxes or bags? Maybe Christmas doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas perhaps means quite a bit more. So would you like to live your life like the Grinch? Now picture the opposite of that person for a moment. Think of the happiest person you know better yet. Bring the most joy-filled person you have ever met to your mind. How would your life look if you patterned it after their values and morals on their attitudes? Remember, your brain grows dramatically when you base your life goals on something bigger than yourself. The word bless, by the way, in our gospel lesson this morning is makarios in Greek. It translates fortunate or happy, one to be envied, a recipient of divine favor. I like that. So who's the absolute happiest person you know. Picture them in your mind. You probably remember mine. I'm delighted to mention her often. It's my mother-in-law, Eileen Markley. She is truly the happiest person I've ever met. And believe me, her heart is definitely three times larger than normal. Every single corner of her life is chucked clear full of love all the time, and it radiates from her constantly. If you've ever met her, you know what I mean. Her love shines everywhere she goes. She is selfless always and walks humbly with her Lord. And that's the basis of her value system, by the way. Walking humbly with the Lord. Blessed are the pure in heart, it says. 
for they will see God. I wonder if there's a lesson here. I mean, let's be honest. We live in a world that is barraged by non-biblical values. I've watched it change dramatically in just my lifetime. We're told repeatedly from sports figures and politicians and television commercials that in order for us to be happy, we have to have certain things. Blessed are the rich, we're told by the deceiver, for their world is filled with toys. Blessed are those who win the lottery, for they'll never have to worry about money again. Blessed are the retired, for they'll have more than enough time. Or blessed are the young, for they'll have more than enough energy. Blessed are those who are skinny, or blessed are those who have curves. <laughs> blessed are those who have straight hair, or those who are naturally curly. Blessed are those who have a job, or those who don't and get to sleep in. Blessed are those who have a family around them, for they have people to talk to. Or blessed are those who live alone, for they have no need to talk unless they want to. In other words, blessed or happy to be envied is anyone who has something I don't. But have you noticed that on those lists of the happiest people that periodically show up, they tell us something entirely different? They always mention an artist or a craftsman whistling over a job well done young child building sandcastles on the beach, a mother at the end of the day bathing her infant, a doctor who just completed a difficult surgery saving a human life. Millionaires don't make that list. There are no kings or emperors, no famous athletes or corporate executives. Movie stars don't make the cut. Those with an overabundance of worldly possessions aren't happy either. Nor are those who live a life of leisure. So what does that say? Experts have found that the chief cause of unhappiness is what they call hedonistic adaptation. That's a fancy way of saying an uncanny ability to always desire more, no matter how much you already have. Rank and privilege, riches and power, earthly rewards, no matter how nice, will never make you happy. You'll always want more. All the fruit in the garden is yours. Just help yourself. But that one tree over there looks pretty good. You know, the one the Lord told you to stay away from. So if that's the case, and I believe it is, if the world's value system, the A-list, if you will, of attitudes and such simply doesn't work, what does? Well, how about a B-list? Pun intended. How about a list of Beatitudes? Jesus is surrounded by a large group of people. So he goes up on the mountainside and sits down. And when his disciples come to him, he begins to teach, saying, blessed, happy, those who are envied, recipients of God's divine favor are those who dot, dot, dot. He shares a recipe for happiness, a prescription for joy. Write it out and put it on your refrigerator. This section of Matthew's gospel has come to be called the Sermon on the Mount, and mountains in the Bible are often places of divine revelation. Abraham took his son Isaac onto a mountain to offer a sacrifice, remember? And Moses went up on a mountain to receive the Ten Commandments. The prophet Elijah went up onto a mountain to hear what the Lord had to say. So did Ezekiel, another prophet of God. Micah talks about many nations at the end of time coming to the mountain of God in order to be taught. The psalmist talks about God's presence on the mountains as a source of wisdom. The great temple of Jerusalem, the house of the Lord, was built on a mountain, and even Jesus, in revealing his glory, did so on the mountain of transfiguration. Jesus is clearly here to teach. 
And when a rabbi sits down, just the opposite of what happens with teachers today, that's a signal that the lesson's about to begin. Jesus talks about adultery and divorce, prayer and fasting, revenge and murder, witnesses and worry, even social justice. It's a long sermon, and just a portion of what was actually said, scholars suggest. (laughs) But he's known for his long sermons, right? On at least two different occasions, when Jesus finished preaching, hungry multitudes had to be fed, which is why most churches have fellowship times after worship. Today, though, Jesus begins his sermon with what we call the Beatitudes. Blessed, happy, those who are envied, recipients of divine favor are those who... Only it's not your regular kind of happy, as if someone says, wow, you really look good, or dinner's ready, or there's no school today because of the snow. The meaning here is much more than that. Deeply happy, abundantly blessed, incomprehensibly filled with joy from above. Astonishingly happy are the poor in spirit. Totally happy are those who mourn. Utterly happy are the meek and the merciful. Abundantly happy are those who are persecuted or insulted. Entirely happy, perfectly happy, completely happy are those who appear to be in the most unhappiest places in life. What's up with that? I've mourned. And I can tell you, it's not a happy time. And there have been times when I was meek too, and people took advantage of me. That didn't exactly make me feel happy either. And I've been persecuted as well, mildly, to be sure, especially compared to what many in the world have to face. But even those times of somewhat minor insults because of my faith didn't make me happy at all. And as long as we're sharing, let me be brutally honest. There have been times in my life when I felt estranged from God, when God felt far away. Some of the great mystics down through the ages describe those times as dark nights of the soul. I've had times when I was poor in spirit, when I hungered and thirsted after a righteous relationship with God. And let me tell you, that emptiness was anything but a happy time. Maybe some of you know what I mean. So what's Jesus saying here? He's preaching in Aramaic, the common street language of his day. So everyone listening would have instantly understood. And a great crowd has gathered, it says. Luke even tells us that his preaching happened, quote, on a level place, on a plateau, maybe on the side of that mountain. So I think it's safe to say that this lesson was for everyone, don't you? And therefore, self-evident? Besides, one of my favorite pastors of all time growing up was the Reverend Neil White, and he had a rule for biblical interpretation that I think is wonderful. He said, if the literal sense makes common sense, don't look for another sense. So let's just assume, shall we, that we can hear what Jesus is saying? Happy, amazingly happy are the humble, those whose spirits have been beaten down. Why? Because now they can celebrate. They have now personally experienced absolute radical dependence on God. Now they're the people of God. Wonderful news has come to those who are sad, those who are bereaved, and those who have dealt with or are dealing with depression. You see, they've been called together into a faith community, one designed to encourage one another. 
Delighted are the gentle and compassionate because they'll live together in safety and peace. Joyous are those who desire a strong and powerful relationship with God, who crave to be put right with God, who genuinely long to reconnect with God. Their search, you see, will be rewarded. They'll be filled with his presence. Happy are those who show mercy and forgiveness to others who now turn the other, who know how to turn the other cheek because they'll receive mercy, mercy and forgiveness in return. Thrilled are those who have an undivided devotion for God, who search for God, who spend time with God. They'll not only see God and understand God, but will know him personally as their friend. Overjoyed are those who make peace, who pour oil on troubled waters, who really understand the concept of loving the enemy because they will be known as sons and daughters of God. Abundantly happy are you when you stand up for God, no matter what. When you're persecuted because of your relationship with God, when you take all kinds of heat because of your godly choices and values. You see, you are the true people of God, residents of the kingdom, those who will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That seems pretty straightforward, doesn't it? And notice that all the descriptive words in this passage are plural. Jesus is talking to the disciples as well as to the crowd as a whole. Every time the word they is used, it implies the community, the family. And every time the kingdom of heaven is used, it translates the people of God. This teaching addresses an assembly. Don't miss that. Because together we're blessed, and together we find happiness and a sense of peace. There's no such thing as a Lone Ranger Christian. At least not a happy one. Put more simply still, happiness just isn't that tough. Micah says it like this. Just act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your Lord. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. I invite you to listen for the Holy Spirit nudging your hearts as we stand and sing our praise songs. Spring to rise as we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Spring will rise as we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. You power and the You the Spring will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Spring will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you pray for Our hope, our be
Each week we come together as a family of God and we share with one another our joys and our concerns. And I have to tell you, I've missed that the last few weeks. There are a number of prayer requests on the back of your bulletin. and I invite you to take these folks with you and to pray for them by name. We have a couple of additions. I'd like to lift up the family and friends of Kent McCarthy, Rita Mintier's grandson. He went home to be with the Lord. I'd also lift up the family and friends of Bill Wilkinson. He went home to be with the Lord yesterday. Um, I like to lift up family and friends of Don Lundquist. He went home uh, about a week and a half ago. Um, and I don't know if the information got out, but I'd like to keep his family and friends in our prayers. Jeff Olney had surgery last week. Don and Mary Lee Olney's son. I'd like to keep him lifted up. Mike Evans had surgery a couple weeks ago and he's recuperating at home. Um, keep him in your prayers. And I'd like to ask for traveling mercies. There are lots of people traveling and some got stuck downstate with the snowstorms. So if you could keep folks lifted up. Are there others that we would like to share this morning? Bob. Got a couple of my joys, praises. I'd like to praise the Lord for the gift of his Holy Spirit. I'd like to praise him for his love, his grace, his mercy, and his perfect peace. I also praise him for the youth of this world. And I would ask for prayers for their futures in Christ. Thank you. Lenny. Prayers for uh, Barb Fogo. Uh, went home to be with the Lord. Uh, retired co-worker. Thank you. We'll keep her family and friends lifted up as well, Lenny. Rick. 
I just uh, like to thank everybody that came to the wild game dinner last night. It was a great success. And uh, I got to share this. We just sang a song about, you know, those that wait upon the Lord. And uh, last night, Doug Erdman was a perfect example of that. And he knows what I'm talking about. Okay. <laughs> He's a pretty good example. I think we should keep him around. Jackie. I'd like to ask some additional prayers for Doug. He will meet with Dr. Tuesday. We'll get his PET scan results, and we're going for really good results from that. Awesome. And uh, a continued prayers for my son, Jason. He had a liver biopsy done, and he will meet with his doctor soon to see uh, how that all came out. We'll keep and I him. also want to say Charlotte got the memo, Sally. Um, last Wednesday was Robert Burns Day. So I invited the people I knew who were Scottish to, you know, wear your family tart. Mine is Wallace. So remember that next year. We have Scottish heritage on the Sunday after Robert Burns Day then. Okay. So I'm not going to recite poetry or anything for you. But... That might be good. That might be good. Thank you. Seeing no others, could we be in a spirit of silent prayer with one another, please? Oh, Lord, thank you for these precious moments together in worship and prayer. Thank you for your presence. It is such a gift. And thank you for your peace. Thank you, Lord, for coming to us right where we are, right in the midst of our troubles and strife, or as we celebrate life and your blessings and in all the places in between. And thank you for opening up our hearts to your joy, the joy that is available in each of these times. We pray this morning, Lord, for wisdom and guidance and for your direction in our lives. We desire to know you, your will and your ways, and we want to be motivated and energized to walk within them. We long to know where you're calling us to be as a church and as individuals and as your witnesses in the world. So please, Father, help us understand, to discern, to know how best to serve your world in the name of your Son. Open our eyes, Lord. Purify our hearts. Still our minds and help us to speak boldly in ways that glorify you. We pray today, Lord, for peace to settle like a blanket on our nation and on our world, for love to rule instead of hate. We pray for forgiveness, Lord, and for the ability to forgive others. We pray for mercy, Father, and for the wisdom to show mercy to others. And we pray for grace, your hand of grace extended to us and our hands of grace extended to those around us. Shape us, Lord, into vessels of blessing. Fill us then right to the brim, and then pour us out so that love will flow into your world. Lord, we also pray this morning for the family and friends of Kent McCarthy, and for the family and friends of Bill Wilkinson, and for the family and friends of Don Lundquist. We pray for Jeff Olney and for Mike Evans. We pray for traveling mercies. We pray and thank you for your Holy Spirit, your love, your grace, your mercy, and your peace. And we lift up before you the youth of our world and the youth of our church. Father, we pray for the family and friends of Barb Fogo and for the wonderful wild game dinner and all the participants and all the people who just gave selflessly last night. Father, we lift up Doug Erdman before you and Pray for his health and lift up Jason Swain and pray for his as well. We also lift up those who are on our prayer list and those who are silently on our hearts right now, Lord. And we ask you to hold these precious loved ones close. 
<clears throat> heal their bodies, calm their minds, and gentle their spirits. Direct their lives, Lord, and fill each one with your Holy Spirit. They are so dear to us. And so we ask these things in the name of Jesus, our risen Lord and Savior. And we pray together now the very prayer that he has taught to us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We uh, worshiped with our daughter and family um, when we were in Arizona, and we went to a mega church, and it was a little different. There were a bunch of tables that people would sit at. There were several different sanctuaries, and it was piped in all over the place. It was a mega church. But we sat at a table with our family, just us as a family, and we shared communion with our grandkids, which was a wonderful experience. Um, so I sort of took the lead and we talked a little bit about communion and what it means. And, and then we all shared together. There's nothing better than sharing as a family, the presence of our Lord and realizing what all that means. May we bow our heads and pray. In a world filled with things that tempt, but do not satisfy that appeal, but do not nourish. We come to your table to receive the elements of communion that fill our lives with richness and meaning. As we eat this bread and drink from this cup, let your spirit so fill and strengthen us that we will know the presence of the living Christ in our lives and seek to serve him in all our days. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and after blessing and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Likewise, after supper, he took a cup and after giving thanks for it, he gave this to his disciples. And he said, drink of this, all of you. This is the cup and the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sin. These things do in remembrance of me. Come, for all things are now ready. <clears throat> 